Well, hello. Welcome to CXQA Live, the home of the agent-centric contact center philosophy. We talk about every week how agents with the right training, tools, and connection with your company are going to be a revenue growth and protection center for your business or brand. They're going to be the best diagnostic tool that you can have for your business. They're going to ensure that your customers are satisfied and connected. They are, themselves are going to produce more and better work, and they're going to want to stay and contribute to the long-term success of your company. Now, along with us today is Dave Seaton, Principal Consultant at Seaton CX, who helps growing B2B SaaS companies combine customer insight and operational excellence to stop the chaos and retain more customers. Great having you back on the show with us, Dave. Uh, it's great to be back on the show. Well... Our topic today may ruffle some feathers, and you know we like a good controversy here at <laughs> CXQA Live, especially the ones that we hope that will be helpful. Um, today's helpful controversy is the following topic, the idea that there is a metrics obsession that's killing customer experience, and we're talking specifically uh, about the unintended consequences of agent goals. So, Dave, what are unintended consequences in the context of customer service and support? Unintended consequences are consequences that you didn't intend to happen. You make a choice, you take an action, and something happens that you weren't planning on. And un unintended consequences actually come in three different flavors. The first is uh, positive consequences. When um, my wife and I got married, we had two houses, we sold one, the real estate market happened to be way up, we, you know, made some money. That was an unintended consequence of my decision to get married. The second type of unintended consequences is negative consequences. I um, you know, we were traveling, we were hungry, we went through the drive through it took 30 minutes to get our food, and as a consequence, we missed our flight. That was a negative unintended consequence. Uh, so third kind of unintended consequence is called a perverse effect, and that's when the exact opposite happens. So you intended something to happen, and instead the exact opposite thing happened. And uh, I'll share a story about that. It's a business-to-business -business software company. That's kind of the stage we're in. So they sell software to other businesses. And within this company is a professional services department that does custom programming projects. So the client requests something, they program it, and then give it back to the client. So the problem is customers are complaining that these projects take too long. The turnaround time is too long. And so the leader sets out to solve this problem and he looks at the process and there's three steps in the process. Step one is programming. Step two is QA. Step three is it's released to the customer. So he looks at this process and he says the most time happens in programming. So let's look at my department performance. And he finds that the average programmer can do 32 projects a month. The best programmers are doing like 44, 48 a month. The worst performance is four per month. So he puts a performance management system in place. He says, for anyone who can hit the average of 32 per month or better, I'll give you a cash bonus at the end of the month. You get 32 profiles to QA, you get a cash bonus. Anyone who misses the target for two consecutive months is going to go on a performance improvement plan. And if you can't hit the target for a third month, you're going to get fired. So now he's got a metric, 32 profiles a month, and everyone has incentives, both rewards and punishment for delivering the metric. So what happens? Productivity shoots through the roof. 
Everybody's productivity goes up. Most people are hitting the target of 32 per month. He's handing out a lot of cash bonuses. People love the extra money. And the end-to-end -end turnaround time that the customer experiences gets worse. Mm. And that's exactly the perverse effect is I did this thing. I intended the, the experience to get better, but instead it got worse. So what happened? Well, as the end of the month approached, these programmers were, they might find themselves behind on their quota. And they knew the end of the month was coming and they were either going to get a bonus or they were going to, you know, get on the naughty list. And so if they had projects that weren't complete yet, they'd go ahead and send them to QA. They get credit for it. They get the bonus. And they knew that QA, it would take a couple days for QA to review them. They'd find the missed requirements. They'd send them back to the agents for rework or the programmers for rework. And then they'd be starting off the next month kind of with a head start, getting to finish up stuff they'd worked on the month before. And so the unintended consequences of giving those programmers a metric-based goal actually produced a worse customer experience. Wow. Wow. I, I think that the reality is that uh, implementing a new process or a new technology or a new policy um, always has that potential, right? Um, you know, and, and it's interesting idea that we're trying to drive productivity and then the overall experience of the customer suffers significantly. And I think it'd be interesting to tie the business outcomes, right, uh, to your story. But, you know, when we think about customer service and support and, and specifically the metrics, um, you know, there are a lot of examples of this kind of thing happening, right? Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. There's research that shows if an agent is measured on average handle time and they have a long call, the very next call will be shorter. Um, there's evidence that shows, you know, agents know how to play that game. They get nervous. They rush through a call. I had a friend who had called, he had multiple issues and the person told him, well, you know, I've handled one issue. So now you need to call back because I get oh. measured on average handle time. Wow. Um, the, I mean, the classic auto dealership example, you know, Rob, you're going to get a customer satisfaction survey and anything less than a 10 means I won't be able to feed my family. Is there anything that would prevent you from giving me a 10 on that survey? Rob, if you can't give me a 10, just don't even fill it out. And now the, the customer satisfaction survey is useless to the auto manufacturer uh, because of the incentive and reward system that's in place that encourage this gaming of the system. There's a, a concept called Goodhart's Law that says when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be a good metric. And it's because behavior changes in order to change the metric not necessarily produce the intended consequences. All right. So just skip to the million dollar question here. All right. Cause you, this is the stage in the show where we've set the problem. Okay. We have a problem. Let's talk about the solution because ultimately you got to have goals as a business. You've got to have goals that you can measure. You need to measure what matters, right? And you've got to tie that to a strategic plan, but it sounds like you're advocating that we should rethink the practice of setting metric based goals for agents. Is that what you're saying? And if so, what takes its place? And you know, how do you, how do you tie incentives and, you know, the behavior guided behavior of agents to these bigger strategic business goals? Well, you said the word and, and most people, go when they discover this, when they experience this, they go then to, okay, well, I'm not going to incentivize the goal. I'm going to incentivize the behaviors that will 
drive the, drive the metric, right? Uh, and that's a step in the right direction. But again, that can also have unintended consequences. One of my favorite examples was a, uh, a company I worked with. Customers were complaining on their support tickets that the communication wasn't good enough. They never knew what the status was of the tickets. They were having to call in and ask for updates on tickets that they've already opened. So they're getting, um, they're getting callbacks and repeat calls for the same issue. And so the leader said, okay, here's our new policy. We, we want you to do the behavior of updating all of your tickets once per day. And then customers will always know what the status was. So the customer support agents would um, work real hard for the first seven hours of the day, get all the tickets done that they could, look at what was left, and then go start to write comments on them so they could fulfill the behavior that management was now asking for. And so the way the story went, they wrote the first comment, hey, Rob, I'm, I'm still researching your issue. You know, I'll provide an update uh, when I have more information. And after they typed some variation of that a couple times, they said, you know what, I'd be a lot more efficient if I just like wrote a template that I could just copy and paste into every ticket at the end of the day. And that's exactly what they did. And so we opened up a ticket and every day for the last 14 days had been a verbatim comment with this boilerplate text that then gets emailed to the client. And so once again, the perverse effect, you intended to improve communication to help the customers, but now customers are even more frustrated. We had one customer accuse the company of writing a bot to, to just post meaningless comments into the tickets. And so uh, the, the behavior-driven incentive also had unintended consequences. Okay, so we're over two, Dave. Where where yeah. where, where are we headed here? <laughs> so I I you know, let me ask you this: If uh, you you walk into the doctor's office and you sit down in the exam room and the doctor comes in, says, "Rob, what's wrong?" You say, "Doc, I'm feeling really bad," and he writes you a prescription and says, "Here you go." How are you going to feel about that? A little bit dubious. Not really yeah. sure that that's the right answer. Uh, that's right. He didn't <laughs> diagnose your problem. And so in the same way, I don't have a prescription for exactly what metrics you should use or how uh, you should incentivize your team. But we do have a process for it. And the process works like this. You start with the voice of the customer. You understand what do customers value in that service experience across several dimensions? And you look at your organization, step two, you clearly define the problem that you're trying to solve, the experience that you're trying to provide. Then you measure the current state performance across all those different dimensions, right? It's good to have metrics. It's good to know how your process is performing. Then you're going to do root cause analysis um, and understand not just the surface level symptoms, but what are the root causes of that current state performance. Then you'll develop countermeasures and you'll test them and you'll iterate on them in kind of an agile development process, improve it, and then put a governance system in place so that the new improved state becomes the way that the organization does business and they don't revert to uh, the previous state. So I'll give you an example of that. Back with our, with our programmers in the 32 profiles a month, as we analyzed the current state and did some root cause analysis, we found some interesting findings. One was not all projects were created equally. 
Some were very, very easy. Some were very hard. One of the guys who was at the lowest performance level just really liked working on the hard projects. He was one of the most senior, most knowledgeable guy. He would grab the hard projects because those were interesting to him and they would take longer. We found that some of the programmers, uh, as they were able to influence what projects they got, they would cherry pick the easy ones. Also, if I've got a queue with 10 projects and I'm trying to hit a certain performance metric, I'm going to do the easy ones first to pad my numbers. So part of the reason for the long turnaround time was that the hard stuff wasn't getting worked. So we analyzed all these root causes and we put a new performance management system in place that for this problem, for this company, looked like this. The programmers no longer succeeded or failed based on their individual performance. It was based on the team performance. So we broke down the barrier of, I'm going to hoard the easy stuff and not tell my teammates how many, prof or how many projects are in my queue right? So that I can hit my individual numbers. Now it was a team goal. So now the team's not going to meet its goal unless we all pull together and we do the oldest ones first, the most urgent ones first. There's a whole prioritization matrix. We implemented workload balancing so that, you know, the experts weren't getting overwhelmed and the, you know, there was a, a balance of workload and completely changed the culture on that team to one of providing service that met those customer values. And so the kind of the guiding light, the guiding principle was meeting those customers' needs, fulfilling those customers' values, and working together as a, as a team to succeed or fail um, along those incentives. And over a year, the department performance improved 44%. And that's measured from the customer's point of view, not the individual's performance. So a couple of things come to mind. You know, the question that I asked, Ari, if it's not purely, you know, metric or behavior based, you know, what is it? Your answer, of course, is a big fat, it depends, um, <laughs> which most of the answers to the most important questions usually are some form of it depends, right? Which is why consultants get paid uh, to come in and evaluate all the factors and to provide a context specific, you know, roadmap and game plan and wh why people who've done that kind of consultative synthesis of data turned into action plan type work um, are a hot commodity in any labor market and, you know, all those kinds of factors. So it depends. Uh, but also thinking about the way that formulaic approaches to these types of issues in the contact center world typically show up, you know, a non it depends situation um, that should be an it depends situation where there's a formula from a pre-existing, uh, you know, framework of AHT needs to be X and CSAT needs to be Y. And then, you know, there's no contextualization to the types of interactions that are variable across the overall agent experience. And there's no uh, starting with the actual customer experience business outcome motivator determining what the it depends should be, right? Um, you know, that pattern of applying that site, uh, sort of formula uh, into a highly contextual situation it's long standing in contact mm -hmm. centers. And it's one of the reasons you see agent turnover through the roof, right? It's one of the reasons that the metrics don't improve when further metric driven policies are put into place, right? Um, so, I mean, we, we've just made a pretty good case for a different way to think, really, is what you've done here today. How, how, how do we get this message to sit more naturally? within the contact center industry and to make this uh, a, a broader conversation, because I think it's not, 
it's not a formula that you just apply. So people are like, well, I don't even know how to have the conversation. So how, how, how can, how can we improve that dynamic industry wide? Not, I didn't realize I just asked you a giant question, but, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's simple in the sense that it's a different type of conversation. And once you become uncomfortable with that type of conversation where there are variables and the, it depends land, if you will. Um, but it's getting people to that place, getting leaders to that place where they're willing to actually sit and think through the contextual realities that uh, I, I think should be the goal. How, what are your thoughts about how we get there? Man, I don't know. Um, I get on podcasts and talk about this stuff, right? I, I write articles about it. Um, structured problem solving, Lean Six Sigma, it's not new. No. Um, voice of the customer is not new anymore. We put those two things together. I've seen um, one of the biggest mistakes that I see when people are trying to improve customer experiences is that they assume they know what the customer wants. Hmm. And they say, Dave Seaton likes live agent chat. So we should invest in that channel because I use it with my bank and my credit card company. And I think it's great. But did you check in with the customers? Um, even if you are a customer of your own product or service, which in B2B is pretty rare, but even if you are, you're still just a, a sample size of one. Let's go talk to more and more customers, understand the voice of the customer, what customers prefer, and then design that experience, not the one that I imagine that they would like. Um, and, you know, Rob, business is competitive. The, the companies that do this well will be the ones that succeed, especially through this uh, economic downturn that we're in. Let's talk about that variable for a minute that you just brought up. Um, <laughs> because the rallying cry of almost every CFO across the land is figure out how to do more with less. Mm -hmm. And one of the prime targets historically for cost cutting measures is customer service in the contact center mm -hmm. um, or finding ways to do the same work with less overhead. Uh, seems like to me there's some pretty big potential pitfalls there. Maybe you could unpack some of that and, um, you know, apply it to what we've been talking about here, because ultimately there very well may be cost cutting opportunities that getting customer centric and really understanding what matters to your customer could illuminate. Yeah. Um, the live agent chat example, I worked with a company that was ready to roll out live agent chat. We went and talked to the customers. The customers said, I don't see any utility in that. You know, the customers said, my issues are complex. I know you're going to have to go away and work on them for a little while. I'll just submit them through the portal or through email and I'll, you know, check back in a couple of days. So we saved a lot of money by not introducing a new support channel that customers want, uh, didn't want. Um, you know, so often I think we get in this mentality that we need to do it all. We need to have all the channels. We need to delight every customer. Like we, we need to, we need to be everywhere and do everything. And the reality is that customers only care about certain things. You have to discover that for your business and then go be best in class at what matters most to the customers and stop being mediocre at, at all the other stuff. Yeah. Um, I think that's an important point. I, and I would argue that in CX, as in digital marketing, as in so many areas, there's a lot of buzz and a lot of market pressure that translates itself into operational and buying decisions that 
often is wayward thinking. It's often very disconnected from what matters to the customer. And I think the, the, the goal always should be, no matter what your role in business is, it, the goal should always be to understand what actually drives the customer. I think about um, principles of economics broadly, which is that there's always an exchange. Yeah. Right. And so we need to make sure as businesses and, and as business leaders that the portion of the exchange that we are providing to the customer is the portion of the exchange that actually drives value for the customer, not making assumptions based on how it used to work or how, what I like, just like what you said. Um, and that requires actually finding ways to get close to your customer and listen to your customer, um, which is its own discipline and its own yeah. you know, sort of thing, right? Yeah, it reminds me, well, I know we're coming up on time, so let's close out with uh, Jan Carlson, I think is how you say his name. Guy was a, a European airline executive in the 70s or 80s, okay? And in this highly competitive market, they decided their airline was going to be the premier business airline. And so they figured out exactly what business travelers wanted. They wanted nonstop flights. They wanted, you know, short city to city passage and lots of times. Hmm. Very different from what a vacation traveler wanted, which was lowest price. They'd endure multiple stops and odd schedules. So they focused on how do we be the best airline for business travelers? If we got seats left over, sure, we'll sell them to tourists, but we are the business travel airline. And they were very, very, very successful with that. And then one of the executives came to him one day and said, hey, I got this great idea. If we add a stop here, and I forget exactly what the route was, right? But it, it was something over Asia. It's like, if we add a stop here, we can pick up the Japanese tourists and make all of this money, like very rich, very lucrative market. And uh, Jan Carlson said, no, because that degrades the experience for our core offering, which is business travel. Hmm. And so that money we think we're leaving on the table by not picking up the Japanese tourists will likely have the unintended consequence of alienating our core market, which is our business travelers. So they didn't do it. Interesting. And in the economic downturn here, that's what companies need to focus on. Who is their core customer? How do they serve the needs of the core customer without chasing the Japanese tourists? Well, I think the, the, that almost sounds like a, a spiel, right? Uh, don't chase the Japanese tourists. Um, you know, but in reality, we all in business have our Japanese tourists. We have our expansion market opportunities. We have our, you know, um, shiny, bright object that seems like we should go and jump. But thinking through unintended consequences and the potential implications that that can have on the negative side for the core market, the core customer uh, is a really critical component of that. Um, so, you know, I would really like to invite everybody because as always, great conversation, so much more we could talk about. Uh, one of the reasons that we switch platforms to AirMeet is that after this, we can go hang out in the post discussion room that's gonna exist after we hit in session and continue the conversation, but we can also honor everybody's 30 minute time commitment that we've all made here. Uh, so I know I'm gonna be there and would love to kind of continue this conversation. Anyone that would like to join us, uh, you're welcome uh, to join us there as well. But Dave, uh, this has been a really good conversation and really good topic and um, appreciate your investment of time in doing this with us, really do. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me back on the show. I'm sure it won't be the last time, my friend. All right, guys, I'm going to hit in session. And then anybody who wants to hang out um, in one of the in the post discussion room in the lounge, feel free to join us. In the meantime, make the world a better place today. Happy Tuesday. Bye, guys.